Karen, I think you're on the agenda next. Okay, give me a second. All right. And I have kind of an unstable internet connection. It keeps kind of wavering a bit. So if I go down, John's going to step in. Okay? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, hang on. Um, I was going to show, start video. Okay. All right, here we go. It's always better when you can see who's talking to you. Okay, okay so we're going to get into some of the mechanics of the actual grassland protocols. But before I do that, there was a question earlier from, I can't remember if it was Larissa or um, who, about um, the beef projects. So yes, we do have beef protocols. Uh, we did our first tranche of beef protocols in 2009. And um, they needed some, they were not taken up. There was attempts, but they weren't taken up. And, and as Max alluded to, you know, you're, you're trying to implement these things. There can be barriers to implementation because you're drafting something, you're putting it out there, and then the community has to start trying to implement. So I wanted to show you, uh, and we have Bill Dorgan joining us just recently. So Bill, just step in if you want to. Um, so Bill Dorgan has... Um, is one of the aggregators with Feedlot Health Management Services who have brought forward uh, two projects under the fed cattle protocol. Um, so they did their successful tranche and I'm gonna go over to another site because they did it under an earlier name of the protocol. And um, to show you the tons and how they're listed on the Alberta Regulatory Emissions Offset Registry I went, I'm going to project details here. So because it, it was under an old one, um, you won't see the tons if you go into those two projects. And Bill's just, and company are just getting their next project verified and think they're pretty much verified um, and just waiting for serialization and registration. So here you have all the paperwork that very transparent that needs to accompany um, the projects, uh, the plans, the reports each year, the verification report, the GHG assertion, a third party verifier needs to come in and oversee everything and track that all the way back to the feedlots engaged, um, et cetera. And so here you can find here and the verifier was Bright Spot Climate, um, Offset Product Developer Trimble Canada Corp. And you can see here uh, on the registry that there are unique serial numbers, um, Capital Power bought some, Governor of Alberta bought some. I think they offset their their trip to Paris um, in the 2015 timeframe. And the trans Delta Generation Partnership has bought some. When they are retired and removed from the system, they are indicated as retired. These are pending retirement. And so you've got about 59,000 tons here that are pending retirement, et cetera. And so then in the previous slide, um, you guys can still see my screen, right? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, in the previous slide, you can go in and search under the new name of the protocol and you will see that project I just showed you. And then we are awaiting uh, the next tranche of carbon. Bill, would you like to add anything to that? Um, you yourself. We've, we've verified the second tranche, Karen. It's, it's up as uh, registered on the protocol right now. Awesome. Or on the, on the registry. I'm sorry. Good to hear. So yes, we have beef carbon, the first beef carbon in the world. Congratulations, Alberta. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. Um, and you can see my screen, correct? Good? Yes. All right, excellent. Okay, let's jump right in. Um, of course, it's stalled. So let's just let that, I have to go here. So the outline in my talk is, um, you got a sense as Max was presenting, um, that we've gone on this journey, and, and Cedric's opening comments um, on what's our first opportunity in ranch lands um, and for ranch, ranchers and grassland managers. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the grasslands protocol, how it works, how it's meeting some of those things that Katie introduced to us um, in the beginning. Max got into a little bit more detail. Uh, and then, um, then we'll go into another opportunity that we would like to um, explore and maybe resurrect 
which is the conversion of annual cropping to perennial forage protocol, which is in a draft. But you know, when you have these types of protocols, they may not seem implementable at the price of carbon at the time, but the price of carbon is not going to go down. We all know that. Um, and then we're going to talk about the next steps about testing and implementing and a little bit around voluntary versus compliance protocols. So the journey. Um, indications by, well, first of all, uh, Cedric setting out to do an improved forage management protocol, the discovery of OGs. We don't really have a good set of scientific data around soil and carbon stock changes under various practices, you know, which is sort of the practice-based approach to these things. Um, step back, how are we going to move forward the first opportunity? And we, luckily or not, um, the abandonment of the uh, avoided conversion of grasslands protocol in the Ontario Quebec uh, system uh, was an opportunity we saw to now reprofile it into the work that the Canadian Forage Grasslands Association was doing. Now, the story here is pretty important in terms of if we look at, and this is some work that Resco has done for NAWA, and uh, Tracy Scott and Tom Lynch Staunton, these reports uh, have been verified by Dr. Tim McAllister at Agriculture and Agri-Free Canada, and they will be posted shortly on NAWAP's websites. But really, if you look at the average annual loss of our grasslands per year and calculate that loss of soil carbon stores, right, if, if it was all to go up, that is a pretty significant all at once. We know it will gradually you know, as it's converted to other uses or annual cropping and emits over time, but it is a significant amount of carbon that is being emitted into our atmosphere. So carbon markets aren't gonna solve everything, but it does give a market mechanism to retain grass and to retain ranchers on that grass. Um, and so as we went down our journey, um, we started off saying, well, can, can we develop a practice-based protocol for soil organic carbon stock change under grasslands, pastures, and grazing systems? Um, and as we started to look at it, uh, and our original uh, ambition around this, it became pretty clear that at this point in time, we need to invest a little bit more um, in the science there's a, against a large backdrop of carbon, detecting a small soil organic carbon stock change, it takes time. Uh, never mind, are you going to be able to sample and get over the variability? Um, just being able to detect it with our detection methods today, maybe a four or five, six year um, investigation until you finally see some kind of delta over the baseline. And we all heard Max sort of say, yeah prescriptive stuff, people want more flexibility, especially in a highly adaptive grazing uh, programs that, that people are always, you know, adjusting for drought, stocking rates, um, all sorts of things on, on the grazing side. Of, and it's, it's difficult to get there. So we couldn't go there yet. Then we said, okay, what about a measurement-based protocol for soil organic carbon stock change? Well, I think Max laid out quite clearly that um, th th there's, there's some challenges with the measurement-based program, not that people aren't trying to do it. Um, if you look at the Australia Soil Carbon Method, uh, we've, uh, we've identified and dived into that quite deeply, and you may ask Brian McConkey questions, our chief scientist, when he presents this afternoon about that protocol. Uh, it can be very expensive. Um, it, it, it can be, there's sort of no counterfactual baseline. You've got to just basically measure at the beginning very intensively and then measure over time and keep comparison-based plots of your old practice there to measure over time as well. Um, and so you're, you've got a duplicative effort here that can be very expensive. So we thought, okay, and apologize for not having an L on protocol. Really our first opportunity, because some of us on this call have been working for eight years on trying to bring forward an opportunity for the ranching community. Um, and it's been very frustrating. So when we started to sit down with the US researchers and scientists who do the National Missions Inventory for the US, and Brian was at the time working for Ag Canada, we said, okay, how did you generate these model, pre-model default emission factors, which is basically what our conservation cropping protocol does, and we've been able to scale that widely across landscapes to the tune of 15 to 60 megatons. Um, to date of carbon credits. Um, 
So we understood that our inventory is pretty much like their inventory. And so we could mine the inventory for these pre-modeled land use change factors. Um, and Brian and his team set about working on that for about five or six months for us, following the same approach that was done in the, in the, in the grasslands. And so we said, well, that one's probably feasible until we can invest as a nation in the proper science for us to be able to really dive in and, and develop a monitoring and benchmark site to, to, to look at soil organic car carbon stock changes. And Brian will be talking more about that later this afternoon. Uh, Katie, you'd mentioned the ISO 14064 project-based accounting principles. These are really important um, in, in all the protocol development what we do, in particular for land-based protocols. Um, these, these are critical to guide the development of the, of the review of the science and the you know, accounting and, and those sorts of things. So when we set out to, to address those principles, we have to look at all the greenhouse gas sources and sinks, making sure they're relevant um, for the environmental integrity of the protocol. So it's not just so carbon. We under, have to understand the nitrous oxide dynamics from urine patches on the ground and grazing from from a uh, rumen for enteric methane emissions. And so we need to think about all those things as we move forward. For completeness, we have to consider all the relevant GHG emissions and removals, and you have to lay it out quite clearly um, how that information was used to support decisions in the quantification process and be transparently documented. In the case of Climate Action Reserve, they do all that. In the case of Vera, they ask the proponent, the protocol developer to do all that. Um, and in case of Alberta, oftentimes we can bring forward seed documents and follow that process. Um, I think in the, in the national system, I think Environment Canada and Climate Change will be doing a lot of that process. American Carbon Registry, you can bring forward your protocol, but you've got to meet all these principles, right? Um, consistency, so you've got to be carrying, comparing apples to apples. Um, you can't have in your baseline a large pasture that has all these animals on it, and then your project get rid of the animals and then do your, your quantification to go, oh, look, our greenhouse gas emissions went way down. Nope, nope. You've got to be comparing apples to apples um, to make sure that the baseline and the project scenarios are functionally equivalent in emissions. Um, accuracy, so this is reducing bias and uncertainties as much as possible. So we rely on our national emissions inventory methodologies. It aligns well with what we're reporting to the UN. Um, and IPCC approaches. Uh, conservativeness, which I think is one that is really important for the biological systems that we want to be able to bring into carbon markets. It doesn't always sit well with people, but it's kind of a critical piece. Um, and Max mentioned it, Katie mentioned it. Um, making sure you're making conservative assumptions on values and procedures that are used to enhance um, that ensure that GHG emission reductions and removals are not being overestimated. Um, and some of the, the, you know, the things we've talked about before with the conservation cropping protocol, it has a lot of conservativeness built in. Um, and then finally, transparency. Um, if we're going to bring something forward to, let's say, uh, the Alberta government, um, it's, it's nice if they could be with us along the way. And I know, Amanda, you've been observing. It's been fantastic. Um, as we've been going through our development journey, but they need to like, totally understand the decisions and the, the, the weigh-ins of the technical experts and the stakeholders to be able to make a, a judgment call, um, an informed judgment call on whether we've met all the criteria to, to developing these things. Two principles in particular, I have found very useful over the years because I've been doing this since 2003, um, is the completeness principle and the conservativeness principle. So if we're going to be bringing biological systems into, uh, uh, you know, the, the rigorous accounting that we need to have for carbon markets, given that there's regulatory relief for large final emitters, uh, in some cases, um, in compliance-based markets, uh, we know that we don't understand absolutely everything that's going on uh, with the biological processes going on in, in the soil or in the, you know, the room and et cetera. But as long as we can, we can look at the complete uh, aspects of that to the best of our abilities, using our technical experts, using knowledge and scientific judgment, relying on peer-reviewed articles, looking at models and conversion factors, right? 
some will tell you, oh, measurement's the best, you gotta use measurement. But in order to move forward, um, where the policy wants to go maybe faster than the science can keep up, and we've certainly experienced that on our journey here, you need to estimate the uncertainty of your estimates. And I think Matt's touched on that because that's gonna be the regulator will want to know that uncertainty because, and there's always gonna be uncertainty, whether you're modeling or whether you're measuring, um, and there will be discounts applied. Uh, but the conservatives principle also does apply that risk-based approach where gaps can be filled in um, with knowledge, expert, you sometimes assemble teams of experts. This isn't gonna be something that's absolutely critical to the quantification, but it's gonna be something that, you know, you need to fill a gap. And so you pull together your best scientists, and we've done this over the years, um, you strive to underestimate the baseline emissions, it's critical, and use the 80-20 rule for collective decisions. And you moderate, but the conservatives principle moderates the accuracy principle. So it's been very, very useful to move forward with all the um, agricultural protocols that Alberta has. I'm gonna stop there. I think there was a question, Graham. Are you there? Oh no. No, I'm still here. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, I thought I lost you. No, I no, think no. I still no. have question. When I'm in presentation mode, I can't see questions. Are there any questions that pop up right at this time? I don't see any online, Karen. Okay, good. Alrighty, we'll continue. All right. So now we're okay. gonna, oh, yeah. We're gonna go uh, deep dive a little bit into the avoided conversion of grasslands protocol, our first opportunity. So it does represent a series of firsts. As I said, it's the first carbon offset opportunity utilizing the markets and private sector investment in order to move forward. And it is the first avoided conversion opportunity in Canada, um, really in, in a voluntary, um, and there has been no acceptance of avoided conversion in a compliance-based market in Canada. So we all have to be well aware of that. This is new ground um, in, in comfort levels, you know, may not be there. Uh, you may have heard some questions around financial additionality and how does that really, you know, how rigorous is that when you're proving the additionality? So it, it, we're all gonna be learning as we go through this process. The eligibility criteria are that the land, the parcel of land has to have been in grassland for at least 10 years. And it's a broad approach here because our National emissions inventory includes both rangelands and tame pasture, so long as there's you know, a, a perennial type of cover on there for at least 10 years. Risk of conversion, I think Max did a really great job of going through the, the, the financial or the additionality tests, if you will, and it can be multiple discrete parcels. So you don't have to look at your entire land base and go, oh geez, I don't want to enroll the whole thing. Uh, maybe you just want to enroll um, a portion of it. And because we have good GIS tools to get good, you know, shape files and everything else, it can be a, it can be parcels that are, you know, put together into a package on your land. The basic requirements are signing of a qualified land conservation agreement, this is easement or servitude or a covenant, call it what you will, um, no breaking of ground, and moderate grazing is allowed, but no confined operations. Moderate haying is allowed. And the monitoring requirements for the full permanence term, 100 years, after the last ton is, um, uh, is credited. Uh, that's in Big Max made a good, a good uh, explanation of all of that. Um, so that's a critical piece here to monitor for reversals. In terms of the rules of the game, I think you're getting a sense now of why there are so many rules. Um, you know, in a compliance-based market, uh, the regulator, really, it's kind of like a hockey game. They sort of said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna design a hockey game. And, and in terms of how we're gonna play, we're gonna design a, 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 the size of the rink. And then there's gonna be penalty boxes, there's gonna be blue line and red lines, there's gonna be a bunch of rules, you know, that, that uh, and a referee. Um, and so the referee is thinking of it as the verifier. Um, and then it's like, all right, go, right? You've got the, the rules, you've got the guidance, let's go. And um, they step out. Uh, in, in the case of Alberta, they, you, you heard, um, who was it? I think James. 
James talked about um, there is a risk of revoking tonnage um, because the verifier, third party verifier will come on. I showed you the registry. Once the verification report is up there, the tons get serialized on the registry. They've all met all the criteria and the registry needs to see all of that paperwork. And then they're serialized and verified and ready for sale. But the government reserves the right to come in and audit um, those projects at a later date, mostly for learning. But sometimes if something pops up um, that is not quite correct or there's an, an anomaly or a flag on the, the play, um, then there may be some more investigation and some offset tons may be revoked. So we've had that happen a lot in the beginning, not so much anymore. Uh, but with new protocols, that could, that's entirely possible. Um, and so the voluntary, you know, the program that the Climate Action Reserve runs, they're concerned about the same things. Um, and there's a little bit more oversight and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so I think we've heard about all of this and how the buyers view, um, you know, the marketplace and what they, they want to invest in. So, uh, and again, Max did a really good job in terms of three additionality tests. Um, and we should probably dig in a little bit more and perhaps, um, you know, assist the governments who might be considering adopting this on how the, you know, the eco or eco, eco, eco gift program works. Um, but these are sort of the ideas around the financial tests and the legal tests and the common practice tests that are applied um, at sort of the hybrid approach uh, at the, the sort of standardized level and then the project level. Just a word about the conservativeness principle and how it's applied in here. Um, as we look at the baseline emissions, if it's conservative to exclude uh, emissions from activities in the baseline, it can be done. Um, but on the project emissions, if there's an emission, it must be accounted for. And so really it's a balancing act in the conservativeness principle. So if we look at what's occurring in the grasslands protocol, and because we're relying on the national emissions inventory methodology, where the, a lot of this is pre-modeled factors, we developed a counterfactual baseline. Said, okay, what is the annual cropping system that would be probably the one that would sequester the most carbon so we went with no-till wheat because uh, of low soil organic loss and low fertilizer emissions um, and we went with with that as the baseline so that was the baseline that was compared to um, the emission factors on all the projects uh, there are some deductions as max mentioned for cropland premium leakage some model predictions error and default risk of reversal we'll talk about those in a minute but in over on the grassland system if there's burning which some of us, some of our provinces do a little bit of burning. Um, they need to be accounted for, and there's equations in the, the protocol for accounting for them. Um, enteric methane emissions, any on site fertilizer that's supplied, um, on site energy use for fossil fuels, and um, wetlands. Let's say if, you're, if there's a wetlands activity that causes emissions. And so the protocol lays out all the quantification for that. In terms of leakage, um, and I don't know, Max, you didn't touch on it, I think, but a lot of the program developers and regulators are very concerned about leakage. So this is like, is there an activity shift that's happening somewhere else because of the project activity that's being put in place? So for grasslands, um, we could see preservation of grasslands perhaps in another area or a forested area. Uh, and so to account for the leakage of that activity shifting, once you have a project uh, and a parcel of land enrolled in the, in the program, there's a 20% discount, a leakage discount that's applied to all grasslands projects. And this is based on a lot of the PCP programs and um, other types of programs that have been operating in the prairies uh, over the years by the federal government and also um, developed within the Climate Action Reserve as a, a logical factor for leakage. Permanence and reversals, I think that uh, Max went into some pretty good detail here around the reversals. Um, and we have a couple of mechanisms that we wanna be able to test in the protocol. He mentioned the ton year or the ton ton approach. Um, and so the ton year would be applied to shorter term agreements but only 20 percent of each credit being awarded to the project developer whereas the the ton ton which would have the carbon easement in perpetuity 
that would be a hundred percent of the credit because of you know just the way these molecules react in the atmosphere co2 being a very long-lived one and hence the hundred year permanence period so in a little bit more detail you have a a qualified uh, conservation agreement, either a minimum term of 20 years or in perpetuity, and then a project implementation agreement that the project developer would sign with the reserve. So that we're talking about the reserve here. Um, and so that monitoring and intentional reversals for the full permanent period or 100 years. Um, and then the default factors, depending on the risk, um, the protocol lays out a number of risks of contributions. So the 2% in terms of unavoidable reversals, so active nature, a grass fire, it's very uncommon, I think. So this is, you know, not intentional. Um, risk of financial failure, Max touched on that, um, and risk of no site by the verifies it by the verifier. So it, you don't have to have a verifier come on site, but you can reduce the risk. The, there's a risk factor that goes down. But we wanted to test a remote sensing tool that Dr. Bill Salas and his team has developed with NASA over the years. You'll hear about that this afternoon. Um, I think Max alluded to the fact that that's where we all want to go is low cost, low touch verification systems. I'll pause there. Any questions? Any questions? I don't see any on the chat line, Karen. Okay. Oh, hang on. Does a uh, question here, Karen, does, uh, talks about a conservation easement uh, have to constitute a legal interest in the land or simply a contract sufficient? Well, the Climate Action Reserve requires that it's a conservation easement. And we're going to have the panel discuss that later on this afternoon in order to guarantee permanence. So we want to test out the shorter term agreements. Um, of 20 years and, and understand what the economic implications of those shorter term agreements are. But, you know, that's one of the things that we've heard a lot about, a lot of discomfort um, around a, a conservation easement in, in perpetuity, but we do have this flexibility mechanism now um, around a shorter 20 year term contract. Another question here, Karen, do you in your site set, uh, the definition of moderate grazing? Good question. John, can you look at moderate grazing uh, while I'm continuing on, the, on the, the presentation? I don't have that at my fingertips, but if we can't get it for you now, we can, oh, go ahead. There, there isn't really a definition um, that's outlined in the protocol. Uh, the main reason for including that moderate grazing thing in the protocol is to uh, to ensure that the ecosystem health isn't adversely impacted from grazing. Um, and part of the protocol is, uh, or the monitoring of the protocol is to, or the reporting, I guess, is that a technical word to use, but the, the reporting has to include um, uh, an assessment of ecosystem health to ensure that the grassland is being kept in a, a healthy state. Um, so the moderate grazing is more of a kind of a, a guideline to um, ensure that eco ecosystem health is maintained. Not to be confused with the second protocol that we are going to be looking at in this presentation, which uh, defines um, um, how much grazing is allowed, which is 50% uh, 50 utilization, but that's a separate protocol. Yeah, okay. so the, the intention is moderate grazing we have some ways of assessing whether the grazing has been moderate. We've embedded um, Alberta's grazing principles. Yeah, take 50, leave 50, um, and the other principles, high level principles, as well as we've talked about rangeland health assessment tools. So put links to Alberta's rangeland link assessment tools, but we also have this remote sensing tool we're gonna to be relying on and, and testing which, um, which we may be a better way and a cheaper way of assessing the outcome of moderate grazing. Sounds good. Okay, I'll continue. So in terms of the quantification, I did mention that it is based on Canada's National Emissions Inventory Report quantification methodology and Brian McConkie, when he was with Canada's team were gracious enough to really help dig in 
and compile the data and the inventory by the geography and climate reporting zones and stratify it by soil texture across the agricultural regions of the, the reporting that we do to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And this is not dissimilar from the way the US approached this with their major land resource units, areas, MLRAs. So very similar. Essentially, um, there's a 30 year crediting period in tranches of 10 years. So the pre-modeled emission factors um, are, are set out in 10 year increments and the crediting period is allowed to be done in these three 10 year crediting periods. So there's tables of coefficients or emission factors that you apply to your area, acres or hectares. Um, we have the 10 year and ton ton uh, hybrid accounting approaches as well. Um, and again, 100 years of permanence. And um, John, I think this was supposed to be animated, but it, <laughs> it's not. Um, so here's an example of the offset potential in Alberta. And these are average numbers. So your time frame is 30 years. Uh, I mentioned before, it's approximately one ton of CO2E, meaning all the gases are bundled into that one relevant unit per hectare per year, or 0.4 tons of CO2 per acre per year. Um, and that's in years one to 10. And so as you start to look at those three 10 year tranches, here's an example of 11 and 12 that cover most of Alberta. Again, we're seeing compared to the conservation cropping, we're seeing like four to eight times higher carbon in, you know, cause it's 0 0.08 and 0 0.1 tons per acre. Uh, so a much better yield of carbon here, according to the texture of the soils and they do go down a little bit over time. It's just the way the, uh, the assessment was done. And so I know that some, some of the folks on the line in Saskatchewan are doing their assessments in Saskatchewan and imagine Manitoba will wanna do theirs in terms of what is that possibility and potential. Mention the discount factors, just to go over them again, depending on the cropland premium, um, depending on the leakage, the risk of financial failure, uh, the verification, uh, the default reversal risk of some god, or, you know, unintended reversal of the carbon, although it's really hard to conceive of what that might be in grasslands. I know that during the Grand Fire, there was some organic carbon in the soil that did, did, uh, uh, did burn, and so that might be a situation. Um, and then the modeling projection risk. Uh, is that discount over time. Now that's the conversion of uh, the conversion, uh, avoided conversion of grasslands protocol. I can stop there if there's any questions. Well, we're past it. We're, I certainly say we are into the lunch hour. So let's stop there, Karen, and I will unmute everybody. And if there are questions from the floor, um, Please ask away. Don't all come uh, at once. Graham, yeah. Graham, we have one more. So I still have till 1230. Oh, okay. Sorry. Because <laughs> I've got a few more slides. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And then we can do questions. And then the break is from 1245 to 1. Okay. So the second opportunity that we've been pondering is this draft protocol um, that was worked on for quite a few years and then um, sort of finalized in 2015. So in this protocol, I'm hearing an echo, um, the eligibility are those same reporting regions, the dry prairie or the parkland, dry prairie being brown, dark brown, parkland being uh, uh, black, thin black, and, and lubisol. The land should be annually cropped at the project start. Um, there's a contractual agreement to commitment to restoration or conversion um, restoration, if it was previously on range and grasslands, conversion for manual cropping, if it wasn't too, and there are frameworks that support it for establishing, um, you know, viable stands in both native range and pasture uh, that were developed by, with a, a group of experts, Ron McNeil and, um, and Barry Adams and a lot of other folks were Karen Raven, et cetera. And again, can be multiple discrete parcels. The basic requirements 
Um, at the time when we developed this one, uh, there wasn't the coalescence around the 100 year permanence period. So we had sort of laid out, you know, a 15 year agreement with the eligible agency talking about a land trust, um, sort of modeling it off the permanent cover program or green cover programs that the federal government had run for uh, many years. Um, that will have to be changed. We'll have, if we move forward with this one, we'll have to revisit it. Um, and some of us have a mind to maybe bring this through the ask, ask Climate Action Reserve, Max, and the people who are there now, Sammy um, or, or Sarah, if, if this might be something that you would consider. Um, I, and, or, you know, if Alberta would consider this one as well. We've had it on the list for a while. We haven't submitted a letter of intent for since 2015. Paying or grazing is allowed. Um, the there are fertilizer application limits. So we did have to bucket things, but we, we looked at typologies and developed typologies that were, seemed reasonable in terms of what people are doing um, uh, on the land. Um, there is some discretionary tillage that is allowed. But, um, and again, it's, it's using the National Emissions Inventory methodologies. So in this context, there's a, a baseline that's a static historic and proof of annual cropping. So you must provide proof of annual cropping. And we've got some really great remote sensing tools that you know, can go back quite some time um, you know, to 2008 and be able to determine you know, whether it was in uh, annual cropping or whether it was in perennial um, and, and provide some proof along that alongside with, uh, with other uh, types of evidence. Um, and then the signature on the restoration conservation or conversion plan. Usually those plans have to be developed with a qualified grassland uh, manager. In terms of conservativeness in the protocol, again, the baseline emissions that are accounted for, uh, we're looking at that counterfactual cropping system that's very conservative uh, in that it sequesters a lot of carbon. Um, and then the grassland system, um, looking at all of the possible emissions in the project, which is what we need to do to account for. Um, and then one of the things that we do account for here is, is, okay, so you don't have any animals on that parcel anymore, but if you're exporting hay, it's going to be used somewhere, it's going to be fed to some animal somewhere, there's going to be methane emissions somewhere, and so we have to account for the off-site emissions. Uh, Permanent period caution, again, it'll have to be updated. And the other types of things are the legal and contractual guarantees and the discount factors for risk of reversal. So we've got some discount factors that are laid out in there for risk of reversal into a buffer pool. That may or may not be the way um, CAR will view this, Climate Action Reserve. It may or may not be the way uh, the uh, Alberta regulator or other governments may view this given the change in permanence. In terms of quantification, the baseline typology, so this is the baseline in the dry prairie regions using our emission factors from the inventory. Uh, we have an annually cropped spring wheat, no till, um, and you can sort of, we're accounting for the, uh, the fertilizer emissions as laid out in the inventory, the energy and upstream emissions, any kind of sequestration of soil organic carbon, because we know in that baseline there is going to be sequestration, minus 0.2 and minus 0.11 tons of CO2e per hectare per year because those are, conser you know, they're, they're conservation type of, of systems. So we're being very conservative here. Um, and then the net removal and reductions from those, those baseline systems. In the, in the project, as I said, a lot of effort went into looking at the typologies here. So you're breaking down the dry prairie um, in tame hay the parkland in tame hay, the dry prairie in native grass, um, and the parkland in native grass. And so we need to think about if we're adding fertilizers instead of incorporating a legume, there's going to be emissions from the fertilizers, there's going to be emissions um, from, uh, you know, operations that may occur, like fertilization on those things, sequestration of soil organic carbon, using the National Emissions Inventory pre-model default factors, Methane emissions uh, calculated in the same manner, uh, and then N2O emissions from manure on the field, plus or minus animals being present, depending on what was, you know, uh, the system being modeled. And then the coefficients, the net coefficients there, 
Um, you can see they range depending on the activities that are going on on the land from a 0 0.01 all the way up to 1.47. So though this is sort of the pre-modeled coefficient type of thing that Max was, was talking about. So what's next? Well, we mentioned we want to test elements of the grassland protocol. Um, and, and, you know, the voluntary raising the comfort uh, with regulators as they see these projects and the way they perform. We believe this is the way it's going to happen here in Canada. Um, and some of the things we want to be able to be testing on the, the grasslands protocol at this point, the con avoided conversion one, is do the risk and reduction factors make sense for Canada? Um, in some cases, we've just sort of adopted what, what uh, the U.S. has done. Uh, does the eligibility criterion scope make sense? What about those thresholds on cropping premium? Within our team, we have a lot of debate about those. Uh, do the scopes of included and excluded emission sources make sense? Do we burn? Maybe in some provinces we do. Maybe we don't. Maybe we've sort of said, no, no more burning. We need to figure that out. Data availability and cost, understanding you know, just the mechanics and the costs associated with this. Um, you're starting to discover that as we're talking to the appraisal community. Um, and then seeing if we can reduce some of the, the costs on monitoring and verification. And we'll hear from Bill Salas later this afternoon on his rangeland decision support tool um, that we can maybe streamline it so that we can have less discounts, more carbon yield, um, and so, and making carbon happen faster. Test and refine implementation, you can read through the rest of them. What, is, what about that 10 year approach with a shorter term 20 year agreement? Is that gonna be palatable? Um, what are the amount of credits that, that can be generated through that? Is that gonna work? Um, and then hopefully, and we've already been in discussions with at least Alberta Environment and Parks, um, maybe adapting the protocol into a Canadian compliance program um, and there may be interest from other provinces if they're moving forward with their own offset systems. And so that's kind of what we, what we would hope to achieve in the short term. Um, and, it, and, and, you know, we know that in the U.S., under the Climate Action Reserve, that Google and Microsoft are paying between $8 and $10 U.S., which is pretty fair. It's a pretty fair price for a voluntary program, but it, that also speaks to the confidence that the buying community, the voluntary buying community has in the Climate Action Reserve's um, rigor and process and standards. Um, in the Alberta market, we're going to be over $30 this year. Uh, we will be uh, uh, $40 next year and $50 in 2022 as we align with the expectations of the federal government on carbon pricing. And so in many ways, there may be more revenue in a compliance market. So that's kind of our, our eye on the prize, if you will. And that's it. How are we doing for time? Eight Good. Minutes Karen, away. there's a question from the chat line. Okay. Is that when you were talking about the nitrogen applications, uh, is, it, is it the actual nitrogen being applied? Like the end content? Yeah. Of the, yes, yes. The lines are unmuted, everybody. Uh, you are certainly free to ask questions for the next little bit if you have some. If you're more comfortable typing your questions out on the chat line, feel free. Uh, but the, uh, the, the question line is open. Karen, I'm not hearing Karen, a rush. A rush. Oh. Question here. Hi, Karen. Thanks for that presentation. It's Glenn Friesen. I'm in here. Um, quick question. I mean, not a quick one. I know it's lunch. Maybe you have time to to um, give us a lengthy answer. But what would you see as the next steps for other provinces to, to get involved in this? Are you, you know, Alberta is the head of the game without question. I think uh, a few of us are looking from, you know, uh, outside the border to see how we might engage in this conversation as a department, as a province, and how we might um, support that 
sort of a, you know, your last slide talking about Canadian alliance on this. Great. Good question, Glenn. Um, you know, as we've been presenting on this opportunity, now when I say we, it's Cedric, it's Tom Lynch Staunton, um, it's ourselves and our celebrity in the making, John Alcock, who's been in Grain News, and, um, and uh, others talking about, you know, this is a potential opportunity. We've had lots of people from your provinces reach out. Um, uh, to CFGA or to Varesco or uh, to Tom. And uh, I must say the response has been pretty overwhelming. So in your province alone, Glenn, there was a, a reach out through our, our website saying, we really want to have our community pastures enrolled in this. Um, we've got significant community pastures in Manitoba. And so they see this as a mechanism to keep uh, cows on grass, ranchers on, on the land, um, and they, they would like to be part of whatever testing we, we think of as we proceed. Uh, in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan stock growers and, and Chad's been sort of working with uh, SaskAg to look at the eligibility of the various lands according to the CLI 1, 2, 3, 4, perhaps 5, just to be pre preparatory. Uh, stratified by texture. So what you can be doing, if you're if you're interested, you can be doing some assessments. Um, you you can be talking about it internally with with your your sister departments. Um, I know that um, Jackie, and not to put her on the spot, but um, in terms of who's been following the development of this. Uh, we've had uh, people from Jackie Mercer's team at Environment Canada and Climate Change, uh, the Climate Bureau um, for, you know, I'm not saying she's not, she, this is a voluntary program. She's made it very clear that she would initially start with existing protocols in compliance markets in Canada. But as we move forward and do some testing and refinement, and the expectation is that we would hope that it would become part of the compliance markets in Canada. Um, I would hope that all of you would be following along really closely um, as we try to deploy some of this stuff and test it on the ground and be part of that. Okay. Any other questions for Karen?